From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and I'm really excited uh, for our guest here for episode 16. Um, I had a, a good friend who told me that we needed to call this Elite Athletic Development Podcast instead of the Elite Baseball Development Podcast because it opens us up to a broader audience. And yes, uh, guests like this actually probably make me realize that that was uh, definitely a good recommendation because um, there's some really far reaching implications of the information we shared today that go you know, well beyond just the world of baseball. So I think you'll realize that as we get to our guest um, and he's outstanding. With that said, um, our sponsor for today is AccuMobility. Um, this is a company that has really been an absolute game changer uh, for us at Cressy Sports Performance over the past few years. It's the only flat base mobility ball um, that basically allows you to keep the ball in contact with a trigger point um, so you can do active mobility. You know, in the past, we'd use baseballs, we'd use lacrosse balls, and they'd roll all around. Um, and this is something that's been really, really influential in the way that we've worked on things around the neck, working on a quadratus lumborum, hip external rotators. Um, it's, it's awesome to have a mobility implement um, with different levels of give to them um, that you can use against the wall, a rack, or really any floor service, and it won't roll away on you. So it allows you to do some really innovative innovative and advanced mobility exercises, allows you, allows you to safely work um, on more delicate areas like the neck and the shoulder. Um, and the company Acumobility Mobility has a lot of great mobility tools that go far beyond just the, the blue and the orange Acumobility Mobility balls that we talk about so much. So um, they're also really good on social media with some educational stuff, um, teaching people how to assess and correct movement problems to improve performance and reduce the risk of injury. Um, with that said, they've actually created a special coupon code uh, for our list listeners, if you head to csp.acumobility.com backslash podcast and enter the coupon code CSP10, you'll get 10% off on your order. Again, that's csp.acumobility.com backslash podcast, csp.acumobility.com backslash podcast podcast and the coupon code is CSP10. Um, there's some really great stuff that you can choose from um, to really build your mobility arsenal and bulletproof your athletes. Today's guest is a professor from the University of Waterloo where he recently retired after over 30 years. His laboratory and experimental research in the clinic investigated issues related to the causal mechanisms of back pain, how to rehabilitate back pain folks, and enhance, enhance both injury resilience and performance. He's often sought out by governments, corporations, legal experts, medical groups, as well as elite athletes and teams from around the world for really advanced cases of low back pain. His work has produced well over 240 peer-reviewed scientific journal papers, several textbooks, and many international awards. He's mentored 37 graduate students along this journey who are continuing to contribute to the body of knowledge. During this time, he taught thousands of clinicians and practitioners in professional development, and his continuing education courses around the world are some of the best that you could possibly attend. I've been to several over the past decade plus, and every single time I see him speak in conference, I pick up something new that has a profound, immediate impact on the way that we train our athletes and general fitness populations alike. Uh, he continues as the chief scientific officer for BackFit Pro Incorporated, and he regularly sees uh, difficult back cases um, as consultations. Um, we're really excited to welcome to the podcast, Dr. Stuart McGill. All right. Welcome to the show, Stu. Well, good morning, Eric. This is, uh, I, I've, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, I don't know. My first recollection of you is is of a young buck who was pretty strong, moving well, and I believe it was um, at Art McDermott's gym. And I, I so. don't know how many years ago, but uh, I've watched you develop your fabulous career and whatnot. So uh, anyway, I'm really looking forward to her. We're our excited time. to have you. Yeah, it was uh, it was funny. I think we met up in the early 2000s and in, in 2006. I think it was the first time I saw you in seminar and we did the interview for Teen Nation and um, I think I've seen you three times since plus every year on the Perform Better Tour. So uh, what I always tell folks is 
you're, you're spoiled when you see Dr. McGill because not only are you a fabulous presenter, but what's great is it's never the same information because you've been so prolific in the research world and in challenging your own views and trying to evolve. So you always walk away with some really, really good, not just tidbits, but core competencies that make you change the way that you train. So that's always a good sign of a, of a great presenter. Um, it's probably because I'm just forgetful. And remember, <laughs> uh, uh, re remember all of the information all the time. So it comes out slightly differently. <laughs> oh, well, it's outstanding. So what, what I do want to do is, so normally if we were doing this podcast just for a, a crew of, you know, perform better attendees or rehabilitation specialists, you know, I think we could, we can probably stay with state with no uh, level of uncertainty that people would have to be living under a rock to not know who you are. Um, but I think given that this is a, a little bit of a baseball development focus on this podcast, there are some folks from either the skill side of baseball, players, coaches, um, you know, even folks in the rotational athlete world who may not be familiar. So, uh, you know, I, I think you're one of the most prolific spine researchers out there and you, you certainly have done a lot in the, the actual practice of training um, individuals as well. So, how did you get to where you are and describe where you are is now? Yeah, well, I was a uh, professor for 32 years of spine biomechanics. Uh, my original question was simply, how does the spine work? And as we probed the various mechanisms of how it works, we then asked the question, well, how does it become injured and painful? What are the pathways to pain? And then what were the optimal ways to rehabilitate specific categories of pain. And then uh, probably uh, five or six years into that, clinicians would ask me to come and see specific patients that were giving them a challenge. And I said, well, you know, I don't see patients. I'm, I'm a scientist, not a clinician. And they'd say, well, don't worry. We, 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 we want to see your perspective. And I learned very quickly that when you, <clears throat> excuse me, treat the person as an experiment. In other words, you listen to their story of what causes pain, what takes it away, their training regimen, their age, their history, etc. Uh, you can then perform probes. You probe their pain and you can identify with great precision the motions, postures, and loads that cause their pain. You can isolate specific tissues, whether it's discogenic or rubbing or frictioning a specific femoral nerve root or a sciatic nerve root. In other words, you can converge with precision the mechanism of their pain by treating them as uh, 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 an entity where you form a hypothesis and you test it. In other words, we performed in a scientific experiment. So using my training as a scientist turned me into this clinician. And then, as you know, we developed a little bit of a specialty on assessing difficult back pained individuals. And of course, elite athletes are very special. Uh, they push the biology and the capabilities of their back. So it, it worked out quite nicely for that. And uh, two years ago, I, I retired from the university, and now I just see patients uh, at my home here. We have a home clinic, and uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's the way to do it. So, and that's outstanding information. And what I, I think I'm, I'm actually really intrigued about um, – yeah, and we'll talk later about, you know, places where people maybe have misinterpreted some of your research over the years and you can, you know, set the record straight in a few different capacities there. But I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is, you know, in the general population, we certainly see, um, you know, a unique present or not necessarily a unique presentation, but a typical presentation of, you know, discogenic back pain, things like that. And then you get into the world of extension rotation sport athletes, you know, golfers, uh, you know, baseball players, lacrosse players, hockey players, things like that. And we see these extension rotation sport athletes that, that generally get injured, you know, markedly differently. Can you please speak to some of the differences you've seen between the, I guess, the sedentary population and this very athletic rotational population that you encounter? Yes. Well, that's a good start because baseball players, gymnasts, and certainly some throwers, uh, their pain pathways form clusters, or very specific patterns. So, you know, if, if I just said to you, here's a 14-year-old uh, female gymnast with back pain, uh, you know, I'll give it away. Uh, 
who are the ones you, you, you see spondylolisthesis and stress fractures in? Well, there's the population. So there's a reason why that extension rotation sport creates stress concentrations on specific tissues. And we're looking at things like facet irritation, spondylolisthesis, perhaps some muscular issues like a sportsman's hernia or an abdominal wall tear. Um, so it, it is the chronic exposure that leads to crossing the tipping point that's determined by, by biology on specific parts of their body. So that's why extension rotation athletes will, will cluster that way. But, you know, Eric, here's a, here's a different consideration and pattern. I'm seeing too many of the athletes that we both deal with, the, the baseballers and the gymnasts and whatnot, they're getting hurt in the gym or the training room. And their patterns are looking more like those of lifters. So, you know, this, this becomes very interesting. It's not the sport. It's the training that's changing some of their injury <laughs> patterns. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, so, you know, let's, let's take baseball as an example where you have one team and now you've been referred three players with spinal stress fractures. Mm -hmm. And then you know another team in the league and they have zero. Mm -hmm. Is it the sport? No, it can't be. Mm -hmm. It's the trainer. It's yeah. the coach. It's what's going on in the uh, training room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a little bit of a, a start on that whole discussion. And, you know, I, you, you mentioned the general population in your question. Mm -hmm. Well, with experience, you learn to recognize patterns. Uh, just something popped into my head that if, if I can just make this final case as well. Um, you know, you, you can't take a St. Bernard and train it to win at the Greyhound track. Absolutely. They're two different beasts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, could you train me to throw a baseball 100 miles an hour even in, in my prime? I doubt it. Could I have been an Olympic gymnast? I doubt it. And... When you look at Olympic gymnasts, for example, they have great rotational ability in their spine. That's allowed by anatomy. Generally speaking, they don't have really heavy skeletal frames because a thick spine creates too much stress when you bend. So a longer, slender spine will create more of that elastic rotation without the stress and crossing the tipping point. Um, but when you look at the angle of the facet joints, they cannot be closed or tight. They have to be open to allow twisting rotation. Now, this becomes very interesting, say, for the baseball pitcher who works really into extension. The open facet angles, they, they almost form like shingles on a roof. So when you go into extension, the upper facet impacts or presses against the lower one and more forced extension causes great stress on the bars. That's what causes the stress fracture. So what you find is those extension stress fractures are in the athletes who have the greater twisting rotational ability. You take the next athlete who has closed facets in other words, the facets don't allow rotation. Um, they will get capsule stress, but the actual bones don't get stress fractures. So isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. The anatomical features that self-select people to twist and throw a baseball or compete in gymnastics also causes greater stress concentrations in the bones that are susceptible to stress fractures. It's very intriguing. And I, and you know, the, the question I think it leads to, I know you were I think the last time I spoke or I saw you spoke, um, I think it was right after there was a, a pretty good run of like Rory McElroy Olympic lifting videos. Um, and I knew you were very outspoken, you know, early on in, in kind of the Tiger Woods low back pain era. And, and, you know, those, those were, I guess, to some degree, what you were speaking about is, you know, there's a level of aggressive loading and compression, particularly in the sagittal plane you know, that to some degree we need with athletes to, you know, train ground reaction forces and, and build muscle mass in the right places. Is, is it an easy answer to say what is enough and how much is too much? Well, it's not an easy answer, but the consideration is this, and you're exactly right. We know what happened in golf 15 years ago. Some 
golfers who were considered the best got into Olympic lifting and heavy strength training. You cannot create an elastic athlete, which is a golfer and a thrower, and then get them to get too strong. The biological adaptations of the joints of the collagen and the ground substance that holds it all together in their spinal discs can only be adapted one way. So um, you're confusing the adaptation of the uh, discs of the spine and, and the various uh, supporting structures. So, 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 so to really make it simple, a golfer, a baseball pitcher, a, a baseball hitter, is an elastic rotational athlete. Be very careful with how much strength you want to add. Um, now, let's change the equation just a little bit. When was the last time you saw a golfer deep squat? Um, the answer is, is never. Uh, the, the, the power comes from external rotation of the uh, hip. So are we really interested in sagittal strength? I mean, they need their knees. When their knee gets compromised, uh, they need more load uh, in their hip, and more responsibility now shifts to their spine. That's not a good situation. So you're right. I was fairly outspoken, telling people, training golfers and the rotational athletes to back off on the strength training. And uh, I did get into a, a little flack with, with some of the great golfers, you know, in, in sports commercials showing their Olympic lifting. But sure enough, almost every single one of them succumbed to injury to the point where they were disabled playing golf. And uh, they now have gone back to training the old way. Isn't it interesting that the club head speed has now returned back to its former speed, which was compromised by too much strength? So t tuning the rotational athlete, I mean, you, you know, I know who I'm talking to, the mm -hmm. shoulder guy. <laughs> yeah. So you know exactly what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. But there's a great lesson for the moms and dads uh, listening to this. More strength is not better. What you're tuning is an elastic machine, and you're trying to optimize better storage and recovery of elastic energy. And we can talk about that if you like. Interesting. And you know, it's it's an interesting uh, actual parallel. So uh, all the way back in 2010, um, every year I would write a, a year-end article. It was what I learned in 2010. And one of the things that I, I actually put out there was I would, I would look at some of the professional baseball players that we worked with, and you would see guys that came in with 16 inch vertical jumps and then they would go throw 95 miles per hour. So they would be elite from a pure rotational slash frontal plane power development standpoint. But from a sagittal plane standard, you know, they were underwhelming by high school standards. And so I actually put that out just as my observation. And within a, about a week, I got an email from a researcher named Graham Lehman on the, the West Coast of Canada. And he was actually doing his master's thesis on the time. It was published in the Journal of Strength Conditioning Research in 2012. And, and their study found actually zero correlation between vertical jump, sprinting speed, and throwing velocity. They found that rotational med ball throw for distance, a, 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 you know, a lateral hop for distance, those are the things that predicted it. So between that and you know some of the concerns about the catch position with the elbows and the wrists and, and obviously the overhead concerns on a, a snatch with you know throwing shoulders and being predisposed to injury instability. We we largely got away from Olympic lifts and or really never got to them with our throwing athletes. And I've gotten some of the same flack. Um, and it, it sounds like you just made one more very, very strong case for being very, very careful if you in, intend to use a lot of Olympic lifts with, with these rotational extension athletes. Well, I, I don't think they have a place. Yeah. However, obviously for other sports, they have a great transference. And, and that's the key. You know, when, when you look at, uh, say, the NFL Combine, what's the transference between bench press on the NFL Combine and, and who's standout in the league? And you'll find it's, it's pretty darn close to zero. When I go back to the old NHL Combine and, you know, how far do you run in 10 minutes? Did that correlate with uh, putting pucks in the net? No, it was an anti-correlation. Yep. Uh, you know, you just identified the endurable athlete, not the 45-second anaerobic monster. Um, but y y again, with my experience across different sports, I think basketball has it, has it dialed in. Their combine actually correlates to transference to, 
to not only performance on the court, but injury resilience as well. So anyway, we, we, we're, we're converging on all of this. That's but, interesting. Um, yeah. so, so one study I actually, I wanted to ask you about. So Soler and Calderon in 2000 um, actually did a study of Spanish elite athletes um, looking at cases of, of spondylysis, so vertebral fractures in this population. Um, they found that 8% of Spanish athletes had them. So these were imaging of, of, you know, both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. They found the highest prevalence was about 27% in track and field throwers. It was 17% of rowers, 14% of gymnasts. Um, and, and so, you know, certainly some of these populations that you expect, I'm sure if they had, you know, baseball players and lacrosse players and hockey players, and even, you know, collisions from football in Spain, these numbers would be way higher. And I'm, I'm sure they're substantially higher um, you know, here in North America, where we do have those sports. What was interesting is you also had a lot of athletes that were just weightlifters, you know, 13% of weightlifters who weren't rotational at all still had these fractures. So does this also lend credence to the idea that the incorrect stuff that's being done in the weight room, it's effectively, it's a magnifier of what actually happens in the sports? Well, first of all, Getting a fracture is not normal, mm -hmm. and there's only one way to do it. Mm -hmm. You cross the tipping point, the biological tipping point of the uh, tissue. So to create a spondylitic fracture, it's the mechanism is repeated stress strain reversals. So consider taking a credit card, and you simply bend the credit card back and forth. Eventually, it's going to crack. That's a stress fracture. And then if you keep going, the card will break in half. That's what people do to uh, the pars bone for spondylolisthesis, just to stick with that specific mechanism. So now let's take a cricket bowler, in fast bowler in the game of cricket, or a fast baller in, in baseball or a gymnast. They are already creating stress strain reversals with every pitch. How much more stress strain reversal do you want to add in the training? Now, that's the, that's the critical question. So, you know, I, I have, this becomes very poignant when I'm asked to consult with, say, um, a top a uh, fighter, MMA athlete in the UFC who's a jiu-jitsu master. So they play in guard on the ground uh, in a lot of flexion and then extension. In other words, they're, they're basically boa constrictors with, with, their, with their own backs and the techniques that they use. But some of them then keep training that as well as expressing it inside the cage and they become so painful they are now disabled and they can't train and basically their career is finished. So what we do is we recognize that uh, core performance, uh, I hate the word core, torso fitness is very, very important. Mm -hmm. But in the term, using the word bending forward and flexion, that is the, the motion of moving forward and bending the spine forward, that's the kinematic, or that's flexion movement. But great athletes need flexion moment, which is the ability to create the flex or torque, but not move it. So consider a push-up. You need uh, the abdominals, the anterior part of the torso, to have uh, strength ability, but you're not moving it. Well, let's go back to those great uh, jiu-jitsu athletes. If when we take out the thousand sit-ups that they do every morning, because that's the tradition of their sport, but that's the reason why they're disabled, and we replace that with stir the pot. Mm -hmm. So now they're doing a plank with their elbows on a gym ball, and they'll stir the pot. Uh, and they do that for uh, some of the great ones for, for several minutes. Mm -hmm. But my point is, we are taking out the stress-strain reversals uh, on their spine, but we're still developing tremendous athleticism. Guess what happens? They uh, get rid of their back pain, their back training, and they keep the movement for competition in the cage. And that's exactly how we'll get baseball players uh, back as well. They're already creating the stress strain reversals, pitching and hitting and that kind of thing. We've got to develop the base athleticism and uh, really it's, it's optimizing storage and recovery of elastic energy. And absolutely. can I talk about that for half a second? Yes, absolutely. Please do. <laughs> okay. So what muscles do is they create force and everyone knows that. 
but they don't realize that they also create stiffness. Now consider a spring, a stiff spring. You've got to really push it to get it to deform, to store elastic energy. Or a very compliant or soft spring, you apply a small force and the thing really has a large displacement. Neither of those are good for a rotational athlete. But when you tune the spring very precisely, it's it 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 deforms a little bit under load and stores that elastic energy and then it snaps back you tune the muscle's elasticity by activating it so you know you 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 know this with your um great throwers when you give the shoulder a stiffer home base to rotate about, in other words, a little bit of a stiffer core, not stiffened all the way down because now the spring won't store energy, but it can't be too compliant either. But when you get that tuning right, you store and recover a little bit of uh, extension, rotation, elastic energy in the torso. That propels the shoulder, sets home base so it can really fire and distribute the athleticism distally through the whip and finish it off with that wonderful elasticity in the hand and the wrist that the great ones have. So be careful with strength. It's really all about this magical blend of mobility and stiffening stability to tune the spring. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. One of, so my first uh, time working with a Spondy case was actually right when I moved to Boston back in 2006. It was one of the first clients that I took on. I remember emailing with you about it because, you know, it's the Boston back race. It's where all that originated. So speaking to mobility is, you know, historically in certain parts of the country, more commonly than others, they will brace, you know, young athletes who have these issues. You know, it's anywhere from a 12 to 16 week brace with a bone scan on the front end and the end. And um, where do you stand on that protocol? Do you, do you like it as a, a modality for healing? Do you disagree with it as something that's a passive restraint that, you know, feeds into problems with motor control long term? Well, I'm certainly concerned about that, um, but the answer is it depends. And I'm sorry yeah. for That's being... That's a great answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm not avoiding the question at all. That's the biological truth. It depends. Mm -hmm. um, but here are the considerations that will allow a person to converge on that. Generally speaking, I would prefer to avoid the Boston brace or any external strapping or belts or whatever and teach the person the discipline of muscularly bracing in specific postures that that produce resilience so uh, uh and it also depends on age the younger the athlete the greater the chance of creating a natural fusion in other words the bones will knit back together again for an older person the chance of creating a bony fusion is much less however you can create a tissue gristling around the uh spondy and uh, get the union so that functionally they are intact once again and uh, resilient. But I'd much rather do it through uh, coaching of positional and muscular bracing c control. Uh, but then it's a question of time. Yeah. How, you know, uh, I, I, well, again, what's your thought on this? Generally speaking, if we can get that athlete to commit to a year of really looking after the back. Um, but I've had uh, wrestlers who've won national championships, uh, baseball players. I've certainly returned uh, um, some uh, rotational Olympians, gymnasts, trampoline masters, etc. cetera. Um, and they've cheated a little bit. They've gone uh, eight or nine months and they were able to achieve the gristling of mm -hmm. the spondy or, or, or stress fracture. But if, if they want to rush it, uh, that's just non-professionalism and, uh, they're done uh, But you know, I know it's, it's a pre-Olympic year, this one, now's the time to get on it. And if they leave it too much longer, uh, they're going to be forced to not take the time it needs to, to gristle or fuse. I think a lot of doctors also treat the brace as you know, it's stupid proof, meaning, you know, if, uh, if you put a kid in a brace, you know, for that four months, there, there's no, 
you know, chance because it's such a black and white thing that they're going to go out and just test the waters and try to push rotation, take some swings or make some throws. So I think it, it maybe is, is much of them reading the situation with a, a 15 year old athlete who knows no speed, but 100%. Um, you know, if, if they're really concerned about him being able to get with a really good physical therapist six days a week to do the right stuff, um, I, I can totally see why they do it. But I, I, to your point, um, I think where the challenge is, is you'll often see kids that get out of the brace and think they're good to go just because they've quote unquote healed. They haven't necessarily reestablished the fundamental patterns they need to protect against a recurrence down the road. Yeah, that's very, very wise. What you just said, you can't use a brace as a substitute for good coaching. Um, another critical element there, would you like an opinion on returning an athlete once they're coming out of a, a situation like that, either Absolutely. with a physical brace or they've been activity restricted for a mm-hmm. period of time? Um, we, we, we've developed this idea of a three-day cycle to test the waters. Where is your back and are you ready to try throwing or cycling, or hitting, or whatever, or maybe swimming, or whatever it happens to be. And what I mean by the three-day cycle is this. So let's say you're a, a, a baseball pitcher. You've, you've, you've taken uh, six or seven months off. You've, you, you, you didn't have any back pain after the one-month period, but you had to let biology gristle and stiffen mm-hmm. the, uh, the stress fracture. Now, day one, Go throw a ball very, very conservatively. Three or four throws, that's it. Day two, you audit how you feel. You may feel even better. Wow, it feels fabulous to get back and throw. Um, Or there might be no reaction, or you might get just a little tweak to tell you, you know what, I can't throw just yet. So that stops the person from really blowing up the rehab and losing, you know, two or three months of rehab. It, it's just a small tweak. But don't do any more if you have a good reaction on day two. It's simply the audit. This allows biological adaptation. Now, day three, go throw six or seven pitches. Day four, what are we, day three? Day four, audit. See how you're doing. If you're doing well, don't do any more. Allow biology to work its magic. Day then then the next day are we up to day five or day six? I guess it's day five. six now. <laughs> day five. Then then throw a little bit more. In other words, you test the waters. Yep. The next day you audit, and then the next day you can add a little bit more if you get a green light. And following that very patient exposure in a graded way is uh, a trick to increasing the success. Absolutely. So we, we talked a little bit, and obviously one of the challenges of kids that wind up in the brace is it, it develops a, an unyielding rigidity um, because you're effectively locking up, you know, not just the, the lumbar spine, but also the hips and, and to a degree the thoracic spine. Um, I know you have some, some interesting thoughts in light of uh, some recent work with Bill Parisi and the fascial world. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Well, uh, Bill Parisi, people will know him for running the uh, the, the speed school for, for sprinters. Um, uh, he wrote a book on fascia. And, and Bill being Bill, he's a wonderful personal guy, as, as you know. Um, he, he went and interviewed some coaches and scientists and, and whatnot, and I was one of them. And we just started sitting out on a, a hotel ver, um, balcony overlooking Las Vegas. That, that's where the interview took place. Mm-hmm. And we just sat there looking up at the stars and, and the lights and whatnot. And he took me through my research career asking me about fascia. And he took me back 20 and 30 years where, you know, we'd done experiments, but I wasn't savvy enough about fascia to really understand what it was I was seeing. And he pulled this out of me and uh, put it in the book, and and it was uh, a lot of fun. Um, So the the first notion that he pulled out of me, but of course I've developed this formally since, was that the body is a composite So what I mean by that is you can take a board of wood and it has a certain strength and a certain stiffness. But if you slice the board uh, up into layers or veneers and then you glue it back together again, putting cross plies in the veneers, what you create is plywood. 
So plywood is a mechanical composite of a normal board. When you measure the strength and stiffness of the plywood, you haven't added any more wood, but it becomes super stiff and super strong. So you've uh, been to my courses before, and you know when we do the handshake exercise, for mm. example, and we measure grip strength. And then I get people and we coach them to create a stiffness through their body, an isometric stiffness, and all of a sudden their handshake competency and strength goes way up. We created a mechanical composite uh, in their body. So now I get back to that notion of tuning springs. You know, the guy who throws 100 miles an hour, if you test his strength, he's not the strongest player on the baseball team, not by a long shot. Who are the best hockey players? Uh, who are the best athletes in many, many sports? They don't test to be the strongest, mm -hmm. but they are the best tuned mechanical composites. So, you know, you, you, you tune the core, the abdominals, uh, that allows the, the shoulder greater rotation. And then you put in the, what we now know are muscular and fascial slings and anatomy trains. So, you know, Tom Myers obviously has, has led this with his, in his textbook, <coughs> anatomy trains. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> let's let's really put that into uh, context for the baseball pitcher. Um, say they're a right-handed pitcher. So really, it's a lunge with the left leg coming forward. Now, what I would do is get the player to palpate their psoas tendon. So uh, you know where the inguinal crease is at the front of the leg. This is on the leg that's going back now in the lunge, so it's right leg back. With the left hand, reach over, palpate rectus femoris, the high middle quad, and then pull your fingers medially, and your fingers will fall into a notch. That's the iliopectineal notch, and you'll be right on the psoas tendon. Mm -hmm. Notice that when you just do the lunge, you feel stress, but it's not the psoas. Mm -hmm. It is... Uh, rectus femoris, uh, maybe iliacus, etc. But then when the arm is placed overhead, the person might start to feel a little bit of tension in psoas tendon. Then cock the shoulder back into throwing position and lean to the side, away from the throwing arm, exactly now setting up that perfect elastic train or anatomy train mm -hmm. and now you'll feel the psoas tendon come on so there is the mechanical composite now tighten the core and you should feel a little bit more tightness coming into the psoas spring now push the heel of the hand up towards the sky and scour it around in a circular fashion in other words you're internally externally rotating the shoulder mm -hmm. guess what you will feel if they have a fascial train and a good composite, you'll feel the tension in the psoas muscle change by rotation of the shoulder angle. So there is the uh, fascial muscular sling of the uh, baseball pitcher. And now our job is to tune that. So there's a... a a thought, and, and it, 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 we did further experiments, believe it or not, on rats, mm -hmm. measuring when we kept the muscles uh, bound up together and activated them in, uh, together, they created uh, super stiffnesses and, and, and super strengths. Um, but when we let the muscles, uh, we, we, we surgically uh, cut the fascia between some of the muscles. So the, the crosstalk between muscles was disrupted. We disrupted the fascial trains and slings. Uh, the, the force production went way down, and, and so did the spring energy. So anyway, th there's some of the things that uh, Bill brought out of me. And uh, of course, we know this in optimizing throwing performance, but the understanding of the mechanism took a few years to really understand and give context to what we were seeing in the laboratory and in the clinic, and then seeing expressed on the, uh, football, uh, the baseball field. I just had a giant light bulb go over my head while you were talking. That was so good. And so I, I remember seeing Tom speak uh, back in 2010 
and and actually wrote up a blog like summarizing some of my notes. It was a, a couple hours of talk and he outlined his eight means of improving fascial fitness. And, and during that talk, he said, I feel like we know about 25% of what we need to know about the fascial system. His eight points were use whole body movements, use long chain movements, use, use movements including a dynamic pre-stretch with proximal initiation, incorporate vector variation, Use movements that incorporate elastic rebound, create a rich proprioceptive environment, incorporate pauses slash rest to optimize hydration status. And number eight, the one that I'm actually the most intrigued to ask about, be persistent but gentle because prominent changes can take 18 to 24 months. So you, over the course of this talk, with maybe without even knowing it, have outlined at least six of the eight. Um, and do you think that 18 to 24 month kind of fascial fitness change is... Do you think this explains some of the chronicity that individuals deal with, with in back pain, even after they've started to, you know, quote unquote, start to do things right? Do you think it's just that we're waiting for the fascial system to adapt and help to, to take down their symptoms as they, they put bad stiffness in the wrong places? Uh, absolutely, yes. Tissues adapt at different rates. Too many people train like bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they train three days a week and, and take the off days off to allow the muscles to grow, which is a bodybuilding training regimen, it's the antithesis of fascial training. Then you take a power lifter who uh, trains heavy and then takes five days off. That, that's what they need to do to, to adapt the heavy connective tissues. Then you get the, the speed athlete where they might train twice a day, but just very short little exposures. Mm -hmm. And then you get the fascial athlete who slow and steady. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's just a little bit of an essay, I suppose, on yeah. differential adaptation rates through specific uh, stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, you know, you've known me a few years. Uh, I don't have any pain now, Eric. I'm in my mid-60s. I feel absolutely fabulous. When I was younger, I trained too much strength. And I had pains. I don't have them anymore. I'm retired. Two days a week, I train a little bit of strength and power just to keep my abilities. Two days a week... I focus much more on mobility that I never did before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I broke my neck. I've got broken ribs. I broke my hip. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a little bit of a history myself. Mm -hmm. But through good mobility training that is not stretching hamstrings or stretching something in isolation, mm -hmm. it's whole body movement, exactly what Tom Meyer mm -hmm. uh, tr tried to state. And it's what you do mm -hmm. with, with your throwing athletes. Mm -hmm. Putting together the chains by being clever creates this optimization of elasticity. It's easy on the joints. You're building great elastics in the body. And I'm telling you, I feel fabulous. I have zero pain. Oh, and by the way, so uh, that's four days a week, two days on strength, two days on strategic mobility of the type that you uh, have developed. And the, the, the other uh, two days, I do something different. I might ride a bike or go for a swim, but I don't ride a bike two days in a row. That wouldn't, that would violate the adaptation principle. And then the seventh day I rest, which is usually a Monday for me. I'm not blowing up a weekend, not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the rich proprioceptive anyway. environment that, that Myers talked about is expose yourself to different things. Yeah. Um, and so there's my biblical training week. And I, I never thought in a million years I'd, I'd be in such a fabulous place. And also getting away from the university and not sitting at a computer all day. Absolutely. That was that was devastating. And, and this but, is maybe but, a opening a, a, a mini can of worms. So I won't I won't uh, throw it at you too aggressively. But so Myers is obviously a body worker. Um, you know, you'll you'll hear a lot of people that listen to this podcast that, you know, are, are you know, wild enthusiasts of you know, instrument assisted soft tissue work, stuff with the hands, dry needling, all these different modalities that, you know, presumably work, you know, on trigger points, the fascial system would be. And then there are also some pretty aggressive detractors um, just because the research, you know, is questionable. So we, you know, we have, you know, cave paintings from over 4,000 years ago that talk about massage. Where do you feel that the manual therapy side of things fits into this, you know, kind of fascial discussion? 
Yeah, well, that's a great question because there's people on the internet who are very aggressive with opinions one way or the other, and they're usually people who have limited um, either knowledge or experience. They say, oh, I'll go and scour the literature and find the answer. Well, there's not too many people who've written more medical and scientific publications than me. So here's me <laughs> saying this now. Be careful with how you interpret the science because science uh, forces the person to create a statistically uh, uh, evaluated study. In other words, you have a population. Uh, you try and create some homogeneity in different groups, uh, and then you test uh, means and variance about the mean through statistics. And that's what, so um, what they will get is a big muddy average. Mm -hmm. I'm not very interested in studies that show, oh, uh, uh, one person or one group did uh, manual therapy and exercise and the next group did exercise only and the next group did something else and then they measure the efficacy that's of no interest to me but that's what these people with heavy opinions form their opinions upon mm -hmm. i'm much more interested in the variance yeah. there were three people in one group that did really well there was another three uh, people in that group where whatever the intervention was was poison it made them worse but what was the difference between those two subgroups? That's the question. So the scientific studies that show no difference are looking at muddy averages. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand the variance. Now we get into the clinical world. We both know of some people, and they are the best in the world, and you and I have worked with them. I've done my very best to get rid of their back pain. Um, I can think of a great Olympian from your neck of the woods uh, close to Boston who I was able to get rid of their disabling back pain. They were back in the Olympics, but they had a little niggly snag, let's call it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the soft tissue skills to release that little snag. I sent them to a soft tissue guru, three treatments. They were unleashed, pain-free, fabulous at the Olympics once again. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to hear, uh, oh, soft tissue has no, uh, soft tissue work has no place for certain people. And sometimes combined with obviously building a clever um, athletic base and movement patterns and whatnot, but a little soft tissue work is precisely what that person needs. Does everyone need it? Absolutely not. But uh, anyway, that's the variance that uh, exists out there, and that's why it's not captured in uh, scientific studies. That's that's very intriguing. And you know, I remember reading a study years ago, and, and we're shifting gears here a little bit, that, that talked about how 85% of low back pain has no definitive diagnosis. Ha having seen you in, in, in seminar, you know, fix people on the fly and, and really get right to the root cause, is it safe to assume that you don't agree with that number at all? Yeah, and of course I don't agree. Yeah. All back pain has a very uh, precise cause. And if you are skilled at performing an assessment, the assessment will show you with great precision the motions, the postures, and the loads that trigger pain. Then your assessment morphs into loading specific tissues. Um, now, if a person reports to you, uh, when I bend forward, my right toe goes numb. When I lift my head up, I get back pain at T12. We know exactly what we're dealing with. It's it's the L5, it's the uh, lumbar 5 uh, sciatic root, because that's the one that serves the great toe on the right side. Mm -hmm. And now you look, oh, guess what? You provoke pain with a shearing uh, uh, instability test. In other words, you can just build up the evidence and you know quite precisely then the mechanisms. Is it a... Uh, a dynamic disc bulge that has a very different pattern than a diffuse disc bulge that started with a compressive injury and a, and a Schmorl's node, or is it a friction on a nerve root at a certain level? In other words, skilled assessment will sort it all out, and uh, you know you can then interpret some of the medical imaging, uh, etc. But no, people who say back pain is of unknown cause, uh, they either lack the assessment skill or a person who's been told that 
has never received a competent assessment. It's based on a flawed medical model. So, and you hinted at uh, diagnostic imaging, you know, and, you know, that's a, a slippery slope, obviously, with back pain in that you'll see a lot of people who are asymptomatic, almost everybody who's asymptomatic will pre present with a, a substantial deviation from normalcy, whether that's a disc issue, you know, stenosis, one of the spondy cases we've discussed. In, in your opinion, what's the clinical Im implication for ordering MRIs, x-rays, whatever it may be, who should and should not get that imaging? Well, that, that, that's a, a big question with, yeah. with yeah. lots of parts to it. So let me start this way with a principle. Uh, let, let's take an MRI, uh, an image, uh, as, as an example, because they're probably the most common medical images that are, are ordered. The MRI simply shows anatomy. In other words, it shows the full history of that person's life. It shows all of their old scars that may have been former injuries, but they don't hurt anymore. But it also shows the fresh wounds, which may be the source of their current pain. So if, uh, if you were to start with a physical assessment of the person determining what triggers their pain. So, well, let's take that example that I mentioned earlier of their right toe goes numb when they bend forward and when they move their head up and move into cervical extension, they get mid thoracic pain. And then you look at the MRI and you see an open fissured disc bulge on the right hand side at L5. And then you see a flattened disc at T12. Bingo. Now you've just been able to assess and differentiate what is a scar and what is a wound on the uh, MRI. So uh, it would be the same with spondylolisthesis or or a spondy fracture. Um, you might be you might not see anything on an MRI, but you know when you test and stress the pars, they are getting spondy pain. You are well informed now that that person has a stress fracture in the making that isn't showed on MRI. So it, it would be uh, very poor practice to listen to a radiologist who says the medical image does not show any mechanism or reason why you have pain because it's not going to show uh, the stress fracture. However, the physical test will. So my, my, my point in all of this is beware of a clinician who the first thing they do when a, a patient shows up is they put the images up on the view box or computer and then they say or declare, you know, you're a good candidate for surgery or declare anything. The best practice is to have a thorough assessment, physical assessment of their pain. And then uh, if it's not making sense, order an MRI image. And maybe they have something sinister. Maybe they have a metastasized tumor. Mm -hmm. The medical imaging is fabulous for looking at those kinds of things. But uh, so generally speaking, if the pattern fits and the person responds to the strategy that avoids the cause and builds a foundation that is allowing the cause to cause pain, uh, then, then problem solved. They don't need an image. And, but and, and, uh, the, the images are very, very helpful for certain types of people. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the other kind of, I guess, tag along to that is, you know, is the, the psychological impacts of seeing something wrong on imaging. I know for us in the, in the baseball world, every pitcher we encounter has some degree of posterior labral fraying if they've played at, you know, some degree of baseball. A lot of people think it's an adaptation that if you don't have it, you probably don't have what it takes to, to throw hard. But if you show that radiology report to, you know, a young athlete, he immediately thinks he's broken. Um, and, and that can create a profound challenge with respect to, you know, the rehabilitation and training process. Well, you know, I, I hear a lot about this discussion, these, these therapists who, who uh, seem to s somehow lately say, oh, you have to be careful what you say to, to people when you're presenting them with MRI reports. When the heck did that happen? When, when, when we started the, the clinic at the university, uh, I set aside two hours for a back pain consult. And, and some of my colleagues said, are you crazy? Well, what are you doing seeing someone for two hours? We see them for 10 or 15 minutes. And I say, well, 10 or 15 minutes has no chance for you to converge on a precise understanding of why they have pain. 
Um, and then those are the people who would say stupid things like, oh, you've got degenerative disc disease and a flattened disc and whatnot. Of course, can you imagine the psychological distress telling someone they have a degenerative disease yeah. when yeah. absolutely they don't? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we start with this two hour appointment and we would explain to them what is causing pain and what isn't. And by the way, that little flattened disc and the, the, the incompetent medic who said you had degenerative disc disease, I hope you went back to them and said, oh, well, you must have degenerative face disease because you've got a wrinkle on your forehead. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same idiocy. But when did, when did people think that we became inhuman? Mm -hmm. I then changed the two-hour appointment to a mandatory three-hour appointment. And now, instead of a clinician and a patient, it became an interaction between two humans. Yep. And then you're not, you're not going to tell your mother-in-law that she, she oh, I better not use my mother-in-law. She's nice. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, if you went, went up to someone and, and, and you said something stupid that would devastate them, that's not being a good human. No. That's being a cold, uh, arrogant, uh, uninformed, We'll call him a clinician. So I don't know when that when that breakdown occurred, but uh, just be a good human. Explain to the person, and I don't believe in treating people like three year olds either. Mm -hmm. Show them and prove to them what is causing pain, but give them a strategy that will uh, lead to a better outcome. Now there's also the category of shit happens and some things can't be fixed. And those are the nasty ones, you know, say they've got post-surgical nerve root scarring or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, I, I, I can't do too much about that. And uh, I let them know if there's a cancerous tumor there, that's if shit happens. And that's out of my wheelhouse as well. But anyway, in terms of MRI images, um, I usually look at an MR and I declare, wow, this is a fabulous spine. And the person looks at me and you can just see the weight of the world come off their shoulders. And I'm not lying. Mm -hmm. I've determined that what they see is actually uh, just something that is there. It happened 30 years ago. It's no lo longer causing pain. And it truly is a fabulous looking spine. That's awesome. So it's been a little bit over a decade since I first interviewed you for, for T Nation. And, and I'm curious, and actually this, this question came from our director of performance, John O'Neill. He was, I asked him, Hey, I'm, I'm going to talk to Dr. McGill next week. What are, what are some things that you're intrigued about? And he was curious, you know, and you've, you've spoken to kind of some of the fascial um, stuff that you've looked at a little closer. Obviously there's been more research. What's changed the most over the last 10 years for you? I mean, there's, there's certainly a million things, but what have you learned and how has it modified the way that you evaluate and treat back pain? Well, uh, I, that's a fair question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to say not much has changed. Mm -hmm. um, the science that we've performed hasn't created any massive shifts or paradigm shifts in, in our understanding or the way that we go about things. Of course, we get uh, a little bit better educated as we go along. We get better skilled at knowing where that biological tipping point is and that just comes so uh, let me frame this in in two words the clinical code and the art the code is the science that we base our decisions upon mm -hmm. we get a little bit better at understanding the rules that govern biology psychology sociology etc everything that impinges back pain and performance but then in expressing the code to uh, create interventions. That's the art of it all. And we get better at the artistry side of, of being uh, clinicians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, an example might be, let's take a CrossFit competitive athlete. Mm -hmm. You know the personality profile that fits that person. They're a type A, they're a go-getter. Mm -hmm. um, now, can you imagine telling that kind of an athlete, hey, you know, your, your spine is not fragile, just keep on training. No, that's the worst possible yeah. thing you could tell that person. You've got to hold them back. That's their personality and, and that's what... What, what, what got them into the, the, the painful situation. Now, the next person that walks through the door is overweight, 
you can tell they don't have movement competency. They're diabetic, comorbid. And then you listen to their story and you, you, you suggest a few things and you know that they start to bargain with you why they don't have to exercise today. Now, that person needs precisely the opposite psychological intervention. They need to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. So there's just an example of, Great. you know, you can read all this stuff in the medical literature, mm -hmm. but it doesn't follow the art. And you learn the art uh, just with years of experience. So That's intriguing. Uh, Do you see a... Um... You know, I, I know I lasted about the past ten years, but what about the years moving ahead? I mean, I, I don't know if you saw it in the in the uh, the layman's publications this week, but everybody's talking about texting neck and people developing adaptive changes from being in forward head posture on um, on their cell phones. And, and I, I'm I'm really intrigued. What what happens when this generation of you know, Olympic lifts are more popular than ever. You know, are we going to see way more hip replacements? Are we going to see more and more spine pathology as a lot of these individuals who are more active in more aggressive ways, um, you know, age and get into their 50s and 60s? Do you see changes on that side of things that we need to be cognizant of ahead of time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, be, so, so anybody on this call should go become a, a hip surgeon. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe they should go and sit in the office of the hip orthopedic surgeon and see who's coming through. And they will see a cluster around a certain pattern. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, Olympic lifters, and I'm not talking about people who do Olympic lifts and training, uh, several repetitions to fatigue and that mm -hmm. kind of, I'm talking about real Olympic lifters. Mm -hmm. Very few of them have back issues. They have fabulous backs, mm -hmm. but they're the ones who, who need hip, uh, replacements, uh, knee replacements, and, and their shoulders are, are getting into um, difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't you believe it for one second that there's not a such thing as text neck? Now, does everybody get it? No, mm -hmm. but give them time and they will have a biological uh, uh, sequelae to that kind of stress. Some will adapt in a positive way. Others are going to adapt in a negative way. Now, building on some of this other stuff we talked about, wh where do you think that your work has been misconstrued the most? And how has the how has the McGill method been bastardized? What what have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm not a great one for social media, but mm -hmm. people will will show me where I've been quoted, or I might mm -hmm. get emails from people saying. Oh, we did the McGill Big Three. We tried it, and it didn't change my pain. And I think, is the McGill approach just doing those three exercises? Mm -hmm. You know, they have no idea that, no, actually, the McGill method starts with this very thorough assessment to get a, a, a quite a precise understanding of what's causing the pain. Mm -hmm. um, those exercises may or may not be appropriate. They may be fabulous for one person and do nothing for the next. Or, you know, a, again, some of these online marketers, they'll say, oh, McGill only worked on pig spines. That's it. Oh it God. is so dismissive and it yeah. is heartbreaking and uh, it's a lie. And, you know, w w but you can't engage them on social media because, you know, it's just this shit storm. That it's a waste of your time. <laughs> it, 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 it's a waste of everybody's time. And these are people who've never worked with us. They have no idea of of our clinical success and failures. They, they, they've read a few papers and they, they, they think they've somehow achieved mastery of the craft to uh, justify them giving a, a public opinion. Well, b before the internet, you had to earn your, your place in, in the hierarchy of, of meetings to uh, be allowed to express an educated, informed opinion and, and give a strategy. So I don't know, maybe you've heard of some misconstrued principles. I, I would say that the, 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 the pig spine one is a big one. And, and, you know, we get the same thing. People say, Oh, oh we do Cressy. And then sure enough, you see a, a terrible video of a 10 year old in the other side of the country executing some exercise completely incorrectly. Yeah. And usually it's someone that, that saw you in seminar a decade ago and you know, you don't even remember who they are. So, um, you know, with that said, and maybe this piggybacks on it, 
what are some of the, the practices that you see now? And certainly you spoke to it a little bit with the diagnostic imaging discussion. What's in gross opposition to the research? What are, what are people doing that's fundamentally incorrect? And we have the spine research to, to demonstrate like this is flawed and people are still doing it. Well, uh, I, I'm going to answer that one on two levels, if I may. One on a very, very large picture perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going to polarize people, but this is the way I feel. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold up your American president and promoting this idea that science doesn't matter. According to him, it's okay to denigrate a person who has a different opinion rather than using principles, logic, and constructive debate to... Uh, reach a justifiable conclusion. So when a person doesn't have this base appreciation for a scientific foundation, they're adrift. And then they become suckers for any piece of marketing hyperbole. So this is a very big picture uh, problem in terms of research, the future, and what science all means. So that, that's huge. The uh, development of social media, for example, and this deconstruction of mastery, mm -hmm. it's now shifted to slick marketing. Those are the people who get a forum now, but the masters, they're not on Facebook. Yeah. That's all marketing. So this notion of, of thoughtfulness uh, based on scientific evidence and combined with being a good human, humanistic compassion and logic. It's missing from your leadership and it, it's so dearly costing society. And, and I fear this more than anything. So that, that maybe was an unexpected answer, but that's at the biggest level. But moving down a level, um, at, at the, now we're talking about clinical practice one-on-one -on -one or as a person-to-person -person or, or, or again, rephrasing that to just a human to a human. Um, the assessment solves a lot of inappropriate, inappropriate mismatching between, say, what a person needs uh, and what they're actually doing. So, you know, identify the goals. What is this baseball player, what's demanded of them from the sport? Know what those demands are and then go and measure if they have them. If they have them, you're there. Fabulous. They don't need any more training. But if they don't have something that they need, you just identified your training goals. Go and find the best tools that you can with the best reward and the least risk and uh, uh, let that shape. So how much more research do you need? That depends. It depends on your current clinical skill level, um, which requires a, a, a research uh, foundation. But uh, if, if I can just mention, I mean, I just summarized my book, Back Mechanic. It's a That's great book. But... It, it, to give a, a foundation, a base foundation understanding of how the back works, a baseline assessment to understand pain triggers, um, a familiarity with what we call spine hygiene and the habits to decrease the stresses that cause pain, and then how to go about building a baseline physicality to allow you to train and, and move through life uh, without triggering pain. Absolutely. And a phenomenal book, one I recommend, I feel like on a weekly basis, um, good end user for those who have back pain, but also I think for you know, clinicians, strength addition coaches, personal trainers who interact with people who have it so that they, they choose their words carefully and correctly. Um, and you, you well, look, I, I hope you also get a few people referred to me with, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they I, say, Oh, I've got a bad shoulder or whatever. I said, <laughs> good, uh, go see Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, you know, one of the things I, I know we have on this, right? So we're going to have a 21 year old college pitcher who's had a spondy and has overcome it and has used that as motivation to go into biomechanics research or become a doctor to physical therapy or, or something to that effect. 
And, and what I'm curious for you is, you know, you mentioned that you stepped away from the university setting and, you know, there's going to be a time when, when Stuart McGill is not doing research anymore. So we need, we need young, enthusiastic, you know, clinicians and, and researchers to, to take the baton. Where do you see the need for future research? What would you love to have at your fingertips um, in the years ahead if, if one of these motivated individuals is ready to, to change the spine pain world? Well, here, here's a funny thing. Uh, at the university, I mean, it developed and evolved uh, the way it did for a reason. We started out with the scientific investigations on a very mechanical uh, foundation. Um, so we would work on, on cadavers, uh, d doing testing of tissues to try and understand the mechanisms of specific tissue damage. Then we looked at real people and, and tried to figure out stress concentrations and stability indexes and things like that. But then we did epidemiological studies, studying the clustering of pain patterns among different occupations and different sports. Then we did clinical intervention trials to see what worked uh, and, and what didn't. In other words, we had to create uh, a spine center with all of these different components to it because all of them uh, played into the back pain puzzle. So now to answer your question, where can a young person go to get that experience? Well, I think we developed it. We developed it that way for a reason. Mm -hmm. I don't know of too many other places that tried to put together uh, all of those uh, elements. That's awesome. And that's very when good. I, when I left, I just locked the door of the university and walked away. Uh, and then uh, within a week, they told me that uh, all the rest of the professors had come in and got all my imaging stuff and force plates and all of that stuff, all my EMG. And it, it, it just went away. And uh, I, I wasn't replaced with a spine guy. That's, and that's unfortunate because you were you were super prolific and made a, a huge difference. So hopefully someone's ready to take the baton and, and try to keep adding to the body of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and and I, let me thank you profusely. This was absolutely phenomenal. I learned a ton. Uh, it helped me not only learn a lot, but also connect some dots that had previously been um, unconnected. So I, I appreciate that as well. Um, folks can find you at backfit, pit, excuse me, backfitpro.com. It's also backfitpro on Instagram. Um, let me also sing praises of your books. Um, Low Back Disorders was a, a phenomenal one. That's, that's a little bit older, but still remarkably on point. Um, Ultimate Back Fitness and Performance, I think is on that top 10 must read books for for strength and conditioning coaches and clinicians. And like we mentioned, um, back mechanic is a, is an outstanding read for, you know, for patients and, and clinicians and strength and conditioning coaches and rehabilitation specialists alike. So, um, this was uh, absolutely outstanding. We really appreciate you taking the time, Stu. No, oh, well, Eric, thanks. And, uh, it, it's been such a joy to watch your career from, uh, I remember that, uh, you were a strong kid, <laughs> from Boston or New England, and uh, but you're a little raw. You're very well spoken and always polite, and that's that's why I always liked you and, and tried to help you. Um, but um, you've developed into this fabulous uh, clinician and, and personality, and, and the leadership you're providing now is exactly uh, what the world needs. So good on you. Thanks so much, Stu. We'll get this up and a lot of people will benefit. So best of luck in, in retirement, although I know you're still working very, very hard in your own ways. Um, we'll be uh, supporting you, and, and uh, I think this made a big difference for a lot of coaches. So thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Eric. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.